Only Sky presents The Deep Playlist of Generation Z by Dale McGowan. I started teaching college music courses in 1991. I was 28, just five years out of college myself. And on the first day of my music appreciation class, I asked the students to name a few songs or bands that they liked to listen to, that they found interesting. There was some Nirvana. Nirvana was big in 91. Amy Grant, Boys to Men, Mariah Carey, R.E.M., Prince, Sting. That was 91. Hip-hop had been the mainstream for a few years, and Public Enemy and LL Cool J got a mention. And I did this almost every time I taught the course, every time I remembered to do it. I try to get a reading of the music that they're listening to, and I'll ask the question in slightly different ways. I'll say, give me the names of a couple of pieces that you think I would like to hear, or a couple of pieces that you find especially interesting, or pieces that you could listen to on repeat, that kind of thing. And in any given semester, the students would mention a lot of the same artists and songs over and over again. More than half of the songs would get multiple mentions in one class. And that was the same for me when I was in high school and college. Yeah, we'd have our offshoots and obsessions, the Jethro Tull kids and the funk kids, that was me, and the metal kids. But if you combined it all, there was still a huge overlap in the middle, a huge number of artists and songs that we had in common. So I taught college music from 1991 to 2006 when I quit to write full-time. And when I found my way back to the classroom in 2017, I started asking the question again. And it was like I stepped out of a time machine because I kind of had. Everything had changed. I don't just mean the songs and the artists were different. Obviously, they were different. But there were other differences in the nature of the playlists. Radical differences, even since 2006, in the way that this question played out. I'm teaching a class right now called Music and Culture for the seventh time at Oglethorpe University in Atlanta, and I have them submit the name of a song or two as part of their first assignment. I've gathered close to 200 songs this way, and among the 200, not one has ever been repeated. Not one. Even the artists are all over the map. Maybe half a dozen artists have been mentioned more than once, but that's it. So there are about 180 artists present for these 200 songs. And some are pretty well known, you know, Rihanna, Kendrick Lamar, Queen, J. Cole, but most of them are artists that I'd never heard of, despite being a very plugged-in guy. Dunya, Asking Alexandria, White Rose Moxie, Chronix, Gorilla Toss. When one of my kids is listening to something and I ask what it is, 95% of the time I've never heard the name of the artist before. Despite the fire hose of new artists I would get from every class and every semester. And here's the thing. A lot of the time they have to check when I ask because they don't know either. It's a virgin entry in their playlist. One that entered without them knowing the title or the artist. More on that in a minute. I've also asked students to look at their playlists and tell me what decades are represented by the music there. When I was in college in the 80s, we were mostly listening to music written in the 80s and the 70s, and some from the late 60s. That's about it. Our collective playlists were about 15 years deep. That's like a playlist today going back to 2005. My students now are listening to music from the past decade, but also from the early 2000s when they were in preschool, and the 90s, and the 80s, and the 70s when their parents were in preschool. Many of them have songs from the 1960s on their daily playlists. Bob Dylan, The Beatles. Jimi Hendrix. My 18-year-old went through a Simon and Garfunkel phase last summer. And two of my students last year had songs on their playlists from the late 50s. That would be like me as a college freshman in 1981, listening to music from before the First World War. So, What accounts for the change in the depth and variety of these playlists? I think two things are going on here. First of all, there was an earthquake in popular music in the 1950s with R&B and early rock. That's when African-American influence really broke into the mainstream. And you start to get amplified instruments with all sorts of stylistic changes that created a revolution in popular music. 
As a result of that revolution, music today has more in common with music in the 60s than music in the 60s had with much more. So it makes sense that listeners today can go back as far as Ray Charles and still feel a connection. But if I was listening to music from 60 years before I was in college, I'd have been crossing into a much less familiar set of fundamentals. There's much more that unifies the music from the 60s and 70s until today. So there's that, the much longer connected history of popular music in that new paradigm. But there's another explanation that I've begun to think is really more on the nose. The difference is in the way music reaches us. When I was a freshman in 1981, CDs weren't even a thing yet. It was still LPs and tapes. CDs came in before I graduated college, but that was really just a different box around the pizza. You're still getting your music in album form, right? Whether it's an LP or cassette or 8-track or CD, an album is a cluster of songs, a 10-song commitment to a band. Even if you buy 10 albums from 10 different bands, you've got 100 songs, but still just 10 different artists. And of course, you're not likely to get albums from 10 different bands in your 10 albums. Half of them are going to be your favorite band. So the diversity goes down even more. But the real shift that explains the deep playlists of Generation Z starts when Napster, remember Napster? Launched its totally illegal peer-to-peer -peer file sharing service in 1999. Two years later, it died from the blunt force impact of a thousand lawsuits. But Napster had done two things right. They streamed the music and they made song rather than album the unit of trade. In 2003, iTunes got it half right, selling downloadable songs at a dollar a pop. But it was Pandora in 05 and Spotify in 06, streaming songs. That locked in the change. Now you could create playlists of songs you liked, but also discover other music without committing to the cost of an album, or even a cost per song. Now when I say you can discover music, it sounds like an intentional process, like you're poking around for new music. That's not the way it happens usually. Both Pandora and Spotify make the process of exploration absolutely passive, if you want it to be. I asked my daughter Erin, who's 22, how she finds new music. She said she'll be running or driving, listening to one of her Spotify playlists, and this is a great feature. At the end of a playlist, it doesn't just stop playing. It plays another song, something similar to the playlist, and it keeps going. Song, song, song. Well, of course it does that, right? YouTube videos, Facebook videos, even Netflix, they all push you on to the next one. Sometimes it's annoying, but it can also aid in the passive discovery of new and excellent things. And streaming media could easily have developed without that feature or without the recommendations in the right rail. And sure, in some ways that would be better, less cluttered. We'd less often find ourselves in rabbit holes a dozen clicks deep, not knowing how we got there, an hour lost with nothing to show for it. But we would also less often find ourselves in rabbit holes a dozen clicks deep, not knowing how we got there. Sometimes the rabbit hole ends in wonderland. And the recommendations and the algorithms and the Never-ending playlists can also give us new and excellent things we would never have discovered otherwise. Anyway, where was I? Right, song, song, song. And if she likes one, tap, tap, it's on her list now. That is the moment right there, tap, tap. Pretty soon you've got playlists full of artists and songs you don't even know by name. You just liked the sound of it, which is really the best way to find music. Now, I also used to ask what kind of music they listen to, what genres or styles they listen to. And the result was always, you know, the most common thing they would ever say is, well, I listen to everything. And I thought that was a cop-out. But my daughter explained to me, when somebody asks me what kind of music I listen to, I don't even know how to answer that. And that makes sense in the context of this kind of playlist accumulation. And even though the charts and the awards haven't caught up yet, even artists are increasingly shunning categories. And gradually your profile evolves and the algorithm suggests even more artists and songs that you've never heard of. Before you know it, you're listening to hundreds of artists crossing decades and genres. Now, on the off chance that there's anyone out there sniffing that these aren't truly deep playlists unless they include the works of Bach or of Miles Davis, depending on which kind of sniffer you are, stop that. 
Yes, I have had a couple of students offer a Chopin etude that blew their minds, but those are outliers. And I wanted to focus on this more widespread revolution in listening within popular music. Most people who develop an appreciation of classical or jazz do so later than age 18. And I think the depth and variety of the popular playlists I'm describing prepare them better for those later explorations than less diverse playlists would. It makes them more receptive to different ways of making music. Now, you'd think by feeding you similar things, the algorithm would keep you in a rut. And I know that was a real problem in the early days of the algorithm. But they've clearly become much more sophisticated. I know when I get to the end of my own playlists, that next song doesn't tend to be a carbon copy of what I just heard. And sometimes the connection isn't obvious. Something to do with the treatment of rhythm, maybe, or harmonic language, or instruments, style. But a lot of the time I find myself saying, huh, nice, tap, tap. And the proof that it works, the vindication of the algorithm and the never-ending playlist is the deep and wide and varied playlist of Generation Z. This is a production of Only Sky Media, exploring the whole human experience from a secular perspective. Like and subscribe to see more content like this. And visit us online at onlysky.media. Thanks.